In this lecture, we're going to talk about drug metabolism. If suppose we take uh, an organism, okay, let's take the human organism. So this organism tries to have uh, least entropy. So the way the organism manages to be in a state of least entropy um, is by taking it chemical compounds into it. Okay. Um, so typically the, the chemical compounds which are taken into the organism, um, they could be macronutrients, Let's begin uh, what we are all familiar with, air, which supplies oxygen, water, um, macronutrients. What are the macronutrients? Very good. Carbohydrates proteins, and fat. Okay. And, um, um, and uh, minerals, um, trace elements, vitamins, Antioxidants. Okay. And these chemical compounds are taken into the body, and these chemical compounds undergo reactions which are classified as catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. Okay. So, what are catabolic reactions? Catabolic reactions are reactions which generate energy by breaking down. Okay, the chemical compounds. And what are anabolic reactions? Anabolic reactions are reactions which build up. Okay, uh, meaning the um, big, for example, uh, the carbohydrates are made into simple sugars, proteins are um, are broken down to simpler constituents like uh, amino acids and fats uh, into fatty acids. And those simple compounds are used to build up. Okay? So what happens is the chemical compounds are broken down into simpler compounds, and those simpler compounds are used as building blocks. Okay. So the uh, organisms is able to build, build up whatever um, is damaged or um, to replace uh, uh, components that are used. At the end of this process, 
wastes and heat is eliminated okay so this wastes have got uh, higher entropy and so they are eliminated by the body because it serves no useful purpose within the body okay so all these reactions when we say reactions we mean chemical reactions all the chemical reactions that are involved in catabolism anabolism and the elimination of wastes are called uh, or is called metabolism okay. so all the reactions that are involved in this process they are called collectively called metabolism so what we need to remember here is in addition to these useful chemical compounds um compounds which are not typically useful uh not uh, useful physiologically meaning not involved in the growth and development of the organism they also enter okay so some chemicals which are not physiologically useful also enter into the organism so such compounds which are not useful physiologically they are called xenobiotics okay okay so what are xenobiotics xenobiotics are chemicals which are not useful physiologically okay what could be the example of this uh, xenobiotics then mm, let's list a few of them here okay so the examples of xenobiotics would be uh, maybe food additives okay like uh, preservatives the flavors the colors okay among other things um the the uh, thickening agents and so on okay all the food additives um cosmetics um say hallucinogenic drugs do we have examples right lsd okay lysergic acid by ethyl amide okay l lsd okay lysergic acid diethylamide okay uh, and um um the uh, constituent of cannabis and what's the uh, constituent of uh, cannabis that is uh, hallucinogenic yes tetrahydro cannabis okay um so maybe cocaine um so these are hallucinogenic drugs and, uh, stimulants like caffeine uh, um thebane okay uh 
Yeah. So theophylline, all those uh, stimulants, okay? And uh, toxins. Toxins could be plant, uh, animal, and this can be terrestrial or marine, okay, like uh, the sea snake toxins. Um, um, okay, so um, toxins, uh, environmental, pollutants like uh, sulfur dioxide, um, yeah. heavy metals, insecticides, etc. Okay, so these are all examples of xenobiotics. Drugs are also drugs which may be both therapeutic or diagnostic. Drugs are also xenobiotics. Okay? Um, so what we need to remember here is that uh, drugs have uh, similar chemical structures, um, chemical say substructures, substructures as the essential chemical compounds, okay? compounds uh, taken in by the organism, okay? So drugs would have similar structure to maybe the uh, similar functional groups like the micronutrients um, or the, the macronutrients or the micronutrients, okay? So if they have similar structure, um, it means that they might undergo the same kind of reactions as the essential compounds do. Okay? Um, consequently, they undergo they undergo they undergo the same or similar metabolic reactions. Okay? Okay. They undergo um, similar metabolic reactions, meaning they may share the same metabolic pathway. Okay? And because they undergo same metabolic reactions, uh, these metabolic reactions, metabolic reactions that uh, the drugs undergo are termed, are termed drug metabolism. So that is why we refer to such reactions as drug metabolism, okay? So what's chemically happening? The structure of the drug, of the ingested drug, undergoes changes. So where does it undergo? Where? Within the body. Or the biological system. Okay? So therefore, drug metabolism
therefore, drug metabolism is a biotransformation process. So why is it called a biotransformation process? Because it happens within the body, within the, uh, it happens within the biological system. And uh, transformation because it undergoes chemical changes, okay? By transformation we mean it undergoes uh, changes in chemical structure. So this idea leads us to the definition. Okay, so what's the definition? So what's the definition? So we can say that uh, drug transformation, uh, drug metabolism is a chemical alteration of a drug within a biological system. Okay? So that would be the definition of drug metabolism. Okay? So now let us ask ourselves a few questions. Okay? Um, what would happen if there was no drug metabolism? Okay, so our question is what would happen if there was no drug Metabolism. So let's uh, mm, try to figure out an answer for this. Okay. So suppose there is a drug, um, there is a drug which is administered per oral, orally administered, and this drug has got a high degree of lipid solubility. So there are, so we said that uh, a drug, because it has got uh, substructures which are similar to the essential nutrients, it will undergo the same uh, metabolic transformation that uh, essential compounds do. Okay. And essential compounds, we said, once it gets into the body and it undergoes catabolism and uh, anabolism and then the wastes are excreted. Okay. So normally what happens is the essential compounds they, um, after their metabol, uh, I mean, after anabolism and catabolism, they are uh, excreted by the different pathways of the body. Okay? Um, so. They are excreted by the excretory, excretory uh, pathways of the body. body. So normal compounds, essential compounds, compounds undergo anabolism and catabolism and the waste products are excreted out of the body. Okay? So these excretory pathways of the body um, how are they excreted? Which are the ways by which uh, ways are excreted from the body? Right, they are excreted uh, through which are the organs? Very good. Kidneys, um, the lungs, the intestines, um, the skin, and maybe through the pulmonary. Okay. 
only part of it. When we exhale the, uh, you know, volatile components, they are excreted through the lungs. So, excretory pathways of the body uh, remove whatever the waste is through the, uh, these organs. Okay? Now, these excretory pathways of the body, um, they are designed to eliminate water soluble waste. Okay? So they are designed to eliminate water soluble waste. But here, our drug is having a high degree of lipid solubility. Um, so, this drug, um, so the body is not designed to eliminate uh, lipid soluble compounds and therefore if there was no drug metabolism what would happen is the lipid soluble drug would be retained within the body. Okay? So in the absence of metabolism lipid soluble drugs would be retained within the body. Okay? Which means this drug would have a very, would have a great um, length of time as their T half. Okay? So they would remain, so in the absence of drug metabolism, what would happen? Lipid soluble drugs would be retained within the body. Okay? So that would help us to answer the next question. And the next question is, what does metabolism do to drugs. Okay? Uh, so, uh, from our understanding of our discussion above, we would be able to say that the answer to this question is that it converts what lipid soluble drugs to water soluble compounds. So it converts lipid soluble drugs to water soluble compounds. Um, why? Okay. Uh, to make to make excretion uh, by the body's excretory pathways easier. To make excretion easier. Okay? So that is what metabolism does to the body. Okay? Okay. So from this discussion, uh, we would also understand that drugs are not only lipid soluble, they are also water soluble. Okay? So that leads us to the next question. What could be The fate of a drug entering the body. Okay? So drugs have got different chemical structures, meaning some of them may be lipid soluble, some may be water soluble. So what could be the fate of a, a typical drug which enters the body? So a drug entering the body um, may have four fates, okay? May have 
either of the four fates. Okay? So what are these four fates? The first fate is that uh, the drug is eliminated unchanged. Okay? So in an unchanged uh, um, form it is eliminated. Okay? So it's eliminated in an in an unchanged form, unchanged elimination. Okay. The second fate is that it may be retained, unchanged. Okay. So the third fate may be that it is uh, uh, it undergoes uh, local chemical transformation. Or the other fate is that it may undergo enzyme catalyzed metabolism. Okay? Or biotransformation. Okay? So a drug can have any of the these fates. Shall we write some examples? Okay, unchanged elimination. For example, um, carboxylic acids. Okay, they are excreted unchanged and maybe from the lungs uh, we have volatile compounds. Okay, so these are uh, excreted unchanged. They are eliminated. Uh, in an unchanged fashion. And sometimes it is retained um, in an unchanged manner, especially if the drug is uh, um, um, non-ionized lip lipophilic drug. Okay? Non-ionized lipophilic drug. Okay? Um, some drugs which share this characteristic are retained um, unchanged and some undergo metabolism. Okay? Um, some drugs may um, have a local chemical transformation. For example, uh, at, the, at the appropriate pH, a pH uh, a drug thalidomide may undergo hydrolysis. Okay? So out of all the fates that a drug can have, the most important one is enzyme catalyzed metabolism which we call biotransformation. And this is the subject of this lecture. Okay? All right. So now we come to the question, what is the characteristic of this enzyme-catalyzed metabolism? So what's the characteristic um, because of which we are so concerned? Okay. Um, so the enzyme catalyzed drug metabolism, it is typically biphasic. Okay. So by biphasic. Uh, we mean there are two phases. Okay? Biphasic, typically, it, uh, it means there are two phases. 
and these two faces we call face 1 and phase 2. Okay, so enzyme-catalyzed drug metabolism is biphasic. There are two phases, phase 1 and phase 2. Now, what is phase uh, 1 reaction? Phase 1 reaction is a functionalization reaction. reaction. So what do we mean by a functionalization reaction? A functionalization reaction means uh, a reaction which a chemical reaction which um, um, introduces which introduces or uncovers a functional group like maybe a hydroxyl group, an H2 group or a sulfhydryl group. Okay? Um, which these groups which undergo, which subsequently undergo phase two reaction. Okay? So what is phase two reaction? Those are conjugation reaction. Okay? Those are functionalization reactions and conjugation reactions. So what is a conjugation reaction? Conjugation reaction is where functional groups like uh, these groups um, conjugate or combine uh, conjugate with an endogenous conjugating agent. Okay, which is present, endogenous meaning it is present uh, within the body. Okay? So those kind of reactions are called um, conjugation reaction. Okay? Um, so, the enzyme catalyzed uh, drug metabolism, it's a biphasic reaction. There are two phases, phase one and phase two. Phase one is a functionalization reaction. What's a functionalization reaction? which introduces or uncovers a functional group like this. The importance of this group is they can subsequently undergo phase two reactions. What are phase two reactions? Conjugation reactions. What is conjugation? Conjugation means combining. Okay, combining with an endogenous conjugating agent. Okay. What are the examples of this? All right, it can be um, glucuronide conjugation. Um, it can be sulfate conjugation. Or it could be conju conjugated to amino acids. Or it could be conjugated to glu glutathione. Or maybe acetylation or methylation. Okay. So the important thing is um, all these things are produced within the body, glucuronide, sulfate, amino acids. Okay. So conjugation reaction is just combining these uh, functional groups with these endogenous um, compounds and that's why we call phase two reactions. Okay. Um, recently, it has been found that uh, the phase two conjugated uh, metabolites um, um, are kind of ionic. Okay? Okay? Metabolites are ionic. So, elimination of these ionic compounds 
requires a specific transporters. Okay, so what are transporters? Basically, proteins which can transport um, ionized uh, groups across membranes. So this, this, all these uh, transporters are included as phase three. Phase three metabolism. Okay. So phase three metabolism is basically the action of all the uh, specific transporters which transport ionic compounds across membranes. Okay. So this is a, a recent addition to the uh, biphasic um, um, uh, pathway okay, of metabolism. Okay. But then this is quite recent. So in um, current textbooks, um, you might not see phase 3 metabolism. Okay. But it's always useful to know this. So, why does this functionalization reaction takes place? Okay, it takes place. Why does it take place inside the human body? Okay. So, the idea is that um, the addition of these groups uh, or the um, uncovering of these groups um, or if these groups are present, the drug does not bind to the enzyme or receptor. Okay? So the presence of these functional groups they um, disable the binding of drug to the enzyme or the receptor. Okay. Therefore, in earlier literature, this process was called detoxification. Okay. So, if the, the idea was if the xenobiotic does not uh, bind to the enzyme or the receptor, then it won't form, it won't be toxic. Okay, and so it was termed detoxification. But later on, it was understood that uh, metabolism can result uh, in so metabolism may result in active metabolites. Okay, so not only detoxification, but also sometimes even activation can happen, okay? Active metabolites. So, this process of formation of active metabolite is called uh, bioactivation. Okay? So, drug metabolism can result in either detoxification or bioactivation. Okay, so this is an important thing to uh, remember. It is also important for us to remember that uh, suppose we give uh, a drug per orally to a patient and uh, the drug gets uh, absorbed and it reaches the blood and through the portal circulation it reaches into the liver and in the liver after metabolism either the metabolite or the drug itself gets into the blood. Okay. Suppose during this process um, the drug is extensively metabolized. Okay? If it's extensively metabolized, very less amount of it would reach the blood. And that is called first pass metabolism. Okay? 
Okay. So, what is first pass metabolism? The metabolism that happens before the drug reaches the blood. So, reaching the blood, we call it systemic. So, whatever metabolism happens before the drug reaches the systemic supply, we call it uh, first pass metabolism. So, it's also known as pre-systemic metabolism. Okay. So, the metabolism happening before the drug reaches the systemic circulation. Okay. So, systemic circulation is the circulation after the drug uh, passes through the liver. Okay. So, because of this first pass metabolism, there are a uh, few drugs which are not given orally. Okay. Drugs not given orally. And do we have examples of these drugs? We do. Um, we have drugs like hydrocortisone, uh, isoprenaline, um, lignocaine, and testosterone. So why are these drugs not given per orally? Because they undergo extensive first pass metabolism. Okay. Um, and because some drugs undergo first pass metabolism, they are given in high doses. Okay. So drugs given in high doses. The idea is a part of the drug would be metabolized uh, pre-systemically and after metabolism whatever reaches the blood will be in the right dose. Okay? So what are the drugs? There is propranolol, atenolol, salbutamol, Verapamil, nitroglycerin, morphine, pethidine, methyl testosterone. So these drugs, why are they given in high doses? Because uh, to account for the metabolism. So it is expected that the drugs would undergo pre-systemic metabolism. And uh, the drug, uh, after that, uh, um, whatever reaches the blood will be in the correct concentration. Okay? Um, yeah. So what are the strategies to, if suppose there is a drug of say nitroglycerin, okay? We want it to be available immediately to the body, but it should not undergo first pass metabolism. So what would be the option? We give it sublingually, okay? So to bypass the first pass metabolism, to bypass, let's write somewhere here, to bypass the liver, Okay, so to bypass the liver so that the first pass metabolism doesn't take place, the option is to give the drug sublingually okay, or rectally. Okay, so nitroglycerin is given sublingually. Okay. Why? Because under the tongue there are lots of blood vessels and those blood vessels directly enter into the, um, they carry blood into the systemic circulation. So that way the liver is bypassed. Okay? So the other way that it can be, uh, drugs can be administered to um, bypass the liver is to give it rectally. Now if we give it rectally, what happens? Uh, a part of it goes into the system circulation and a part of it bypasses the liver. Okay? So um, part of the drug would be available systemically. Okay? 
but sublingual, we can have more of the drug reaching the systemic circulation. Okay? So what's the other option? We can give it into the uh, blood vessels directly. Okay? All right. So those are the strategies to bypass the liver. So it's important to remember what is first pass metabolism and what are the strategies to bypass the liver and what are the examples of the drugs which are given sublingually and rectally. Okay? Um, do we have an example of a drug that is given rectally? Yes, diazepam. Okay? Um, diazepam is given to patients, um, especially pediatric patients where the fever is not controlled. Um, diazepam is given rectally. Okay? And uh, sublingual, we know the example, nitroglycerin. When we looked at this question, uh, what is the characteristic of enzyme-catalyzed uh, drug metabolism, we understood that uh, metabolism is enzyme-catalyzed. Okay, so metabolism is enzyme catalyzed. Now that brings our mind to some other questions. Okay. And the question would be, where does metabolism, here we mean drug metabolic, where does uh, drug metabolism take place? Metabolism is enzyme catalyzed. So, which enzymes are involved? Okay. Um, if there are organs for metabolism, which are the subcellular sites? So, what? are the subcellular sites where metabolism takes place. So let's try to find out um, the answer to these questions. So the sites of drug metabolism can be classified as um, hepatic and extrahepatic sites. Hepatic sites and extrahepatic sites. Why? Because uh, liver is the primary site. Okay? So primary and secondary sites would be extrahepatic. So the liver and the organs uh, which are not the liver. Okay? So that's how we classify the sites of drug metabolism. Okay? So now the question is, uh, now that we have defined an organ, we are going to ask ourselves the question, which are the subcellular sites uh, where the metabolism takes place? Okay, so the functional unit of the liver, uh, let's draw a liver here. The functional unit, unit would be the hepatocyte. Okay, so this is a cell. Now, which are the subcellular sites? Which are the regions within the cell where these enzymes are uh, found? Okay? So that's the question we are trying to explore now. Um, so um, within this hepatocyte, um, 
there are certain regions which are defined. One is microsomes. Okay. And uh, let's go one by one. The first one is microsomes. So microsomes are not uh, a histological entity. Okay, they are something that is artificial. Okay, so the idea is um, if we take uh, the hepatocytes, maybe a piece of the liver, and we homogenize it, and we centrifuge it at, say, 9000 uh, G, okay? And uh, we would get, uh, say, this is a tube, uh, centrifuge tube, we would get uh, two layers after we centrifuge it at 9000, okay? We'll get a clear layer and we'll get uh, pellets, okay, which usually is the nucleic acid portion, okay, at 9000 G. And then if we take this clear portion and further centrifuge it, at uh, maybe 100,000 G, then what's going to happen is we get two layers, again a clear layer, a clear layer, and pellets. Okay? So these pellets are microsomes. Okay? So they are basically aggregates of uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So they are derived from a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? And because um, it's kind of artificial, uh, it's given this name, microsomes. Okay? So when we um, talk about microsomes, it's a non-histological entity, but uh, by and large we mean the uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, okay? So uh, histologically we would mean the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But to understand that, uh, but remember that microsomes are not actually present in a cell, okay? When we do this kind of uh, uh, experiment, only then we get the microsomes, right. So, um, in our discussion here, when we mean, mean microsomes, we mean the smooth endoplasmic reticulum part of the cell. And this fraction contains uh, enzymes. So, our question was, um, where, which organs, and we defined uh, where does uh, metabolism take place. We are asking ourselves which organ. And we learned that the most important organ is the uh, hepatic side or the liver. Okay, so the main organ, main organ is the liver. And now we are asking the question, uh, which is the subcellular site? Why are we asking that question? Because the functional unit is the hepatocyte. So which is the subcellular region? we define uh, microsomes and we mean this smooth endoplasmic reticulum, okay? So this fraction contains what enzymes is our question now. Which enzymes are present in this subcellular fraction, okay? And the enzyme is uh, cytochrome P450. Okay? The most uh, important enzyme which are present in the microsomal fraction are cytochrome P450. And uh, what does it do? It brings about phase one biotransformation. Okay. Uh, are there any other enzymes in, uh, present in the microsomes? Certainly, yes. Okay. And what is present? Uh, we have enzymes which bring about
which bring about um, glucuronic acid conjugation. Okay, so this is a microsomal enzyme. Okay. okay. So the question that would pop into our mind is why is it called cytochrome P450? Okay, so the question is why is it called cytochrome P450? So, it is a microsomal enzyme, meaning we uh, initially produce microsomes and we further fractionate it. Then we would get uh, uh, a solution. Okay? And the property of this solution is that um, it uh, absorbs the visible light in a wavelength of uh, uh, absorbs the visible light uh, of a wavelength uh, of 450 nanometers okay so p means a pigment okay 450 refers to the wavelength of light that is being absorbed. Cyto means from this cell. Chrome means color. Okay, so it basically means a microsomal fra uh, fraction that uh, absorbs um, light in uh, at uh, 450 nanometers. Okay, and that is why it is called cytochrome P450. All right. So the subcellular uh, fraction, uh, one of the most important subcellular fraction of the hepatocyte is the microsome. And the most important enzyme here is the cytochrome P450, which brings about phase one biotransformation and other enzymes which bring about glucuronic acid conjugation. Okay. The second uh, subcellular uh, site of the hepatocyte which contains the enzyme is the mitochondria. Okay. Um, mitochondria contains enzymes like mau, uh, mau, mono amine oxidase um, and uh, enzymes which uh, bring about drug acetylation. Okay. Um, And the other region within the hepatocyte where there are enzymes present is the cytoplasm. Okay. So what are the enzymes present in the cytoplasm of hepatocytes that bring about uh, um, metabolism? Uh, we have uh, enzymes like... Uh, alcohol dehydrogenase aldehyde dehydrogenase um, enzymes mediating uh, methylation Um, sulfate conjugation and uh, 
honor capuric acid formation. Okay. So these are the enzymes which are present in the um, cytoplasm of the hepatocyte. Okay. So we have answered uh, the question which is the main organ. We have talked about the main organ. We have talked about which enzymes are involved in the metabolism. We have talked about the subcellular sites. Now, let's uh, do the same exercise with the extrahepatic sites. So, which are the hep extrahepatic sites? The extrahepatic sites, the most important one is plasma, um, the tissues, uh, the kidney, kidneys and the gut. Okay. So let's take one by one. Plasma. Okay. Which are the enzymes present in the plasma? Um, uh, in the plasma we have got uh, esterases. The most important esterase that is present is uh, butyl Colin esterase. Okay. There is also amidases, which break down amides. Then there is catechol O methyl transferase, okay, which breaks down catechol uh, containing drugs like adrenaline. So these enzymes are present in the plasma. Uh, what about the tissues? In the tissues, there are enzymes, uh, the amidases are present in tissues, and sometimes some esterases are also seen in the tissues. Uh, what about the kidney? The kidney, we know, it's the site where vitamin D3 is converted. So, vitamin D3 is converted to its most active form. Okay, which is the most active form of vitamin D3? It is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3. Okay, and this is done by the kidney. Okay, what about the gut? When we talk about the gut, we need to look at two sites within the gut. Okay? So one uh, is the mucosa. Okay, let's look at mucosa first. There are certain enzymes which are present in the gastric mucosa and those are MAO. Okay, we have written monoamine oxidase and there are enzymes called uh, amino acid decarboxylase enzymes and enzymes bringing about uh, sulfate conjugation. So mucosa has got this. So when a drug passes through the mucosa, these enzymes act. And if the drugs have got this structure which uh, makes them um, uh, to undergo reactions by these enzymes, they will certainly undergo this kind of the, en the, these enzyme-catalyzed reactions. The other part of the gut is the lumen, which contains the gut microflora, meaning the fungus and the bacteria that are present within the lumen. They are not part of the body, but they are kind of resident uh, in the body. They are resident in the body and they bring about uh, metabolism. Okay? Um, so, um, let's say the liver, we've got this liver here. So the drug that is absorbed goes into the liver 
and some drugs undergo conjugation so after conjugation they re, they get through the uh, hepatopancreatic duct and they enter into the c uh, shaped region of the uh, small intestine okay uh, somewhere there they enter into the lumen of the um, gut so to remember that the drug is conjugated meaning the drug is water soluble okay and the gut microflora what they do is they deconjugate okay they make this uh, conjugated water soluble metabolite they deconjugate it uh, to form the metabolite which is not conjugated okay the conjugated part is removed and so what happens this metabolite now becomes lipid solid okay now because it be it is lipid soluble it gets reabsorbed from the intestine so it's li uh, it's lipid soluble it gets reabsorbed okay and then it goes into the liver and this cycle continues okay so this cycle is what is called enterohepatic circulation entero hepatic circulation okay so the that is the role of this gut microflora they can bring about deconjugation okay so now imagine a case where suppose there is a patient who is taking um, a female patient on oral contraceptives okay so this patient takes uh, ocp the um, steroid part of it gets conjugated it reaches the intestine it is deconjugated and then it is reabsorbed okay uh this conjugation takes place in the liver okay it is reabsorbed into the liver and this cycle continues and what is the consequence of that the ocp has got a long duration of action now imagine this same patient consumes a broad spectrum antibiotic okay consumes a broad spectrum antibiotic and then what happens the bacteria the the gut micro microflora gets killed and so what happens the conjugated drug is not reconjugated deconjugated okay so as a result the conjugated drug now in this case uh ocp plus broad spectrum antibiotic okay so then what happens the gut microflora gets killed as a result deconjugation does not take place as a result the conjugated steroid is excreted okay so what happens here is now the ocp does not have a long duration of action so this can lead to contraceptive failure so that is a consequence of uh the gut the interference with gut microflora okay all right so with that we have uh, answered this question we have uh, answered where metabolism takes place we have asked we have answered where the which enzymes are involved and we have seen which are the subcellular sites where metabolism takes place okay 
So in part one of this lecture, we have looked at uh, the, uh, we have asked ourselves lots of questions and we have answered those questions. Okay? We uh, started out with looking at drug metabolism. We defined what is drug metabolism. We asked lots of important questions. Okay? And the fifth one was, um, uh, uh, well, which are the sites? We asked which are the sites, which are the subcellular sites. And we asked which enzymes are involved. Okay. So in this lecture, we covered the definition. We asked ourselves what would happen if there was no drug metabolism. We asked what does metabolism do to the drugs. We asked what could be the fate of drugs entering the body. We asked what is the characteristic of enzyme-catalyzed drug metabolism. And we asked which are the sites, which are the subcellular sites, which are the enzymes which are involved in the metabolism. Okay? And we have looked at uh, uh, clinical um, application as well. So this is part one of the lecture. We will continue our discussion with part two.